there are a number of people who say, you know, I handled stress pretty well until this year. And there were some stressful things happening in this year. But like before that, I handled stress pretty well. I wasn't anxious all the time. Sure, maybe I was an anxious personality, but it wasn't getting in my quality of life, my functioning and in, in my day-to-day -day experience until this year. If you want to live like you matter, ditch the pills, look great, and feel freaking amazing, you're in the right place. I'm Dr. Wendy Trubo. And I'm Dr. Ed Lovatan. Welcome to the Feel Freaking Amazing Podcast. Where we empower you to live a vibrant and healthy life by optimizing your structural, chemical, emotional, social, and spiritual lives. Hold on to your hats. Welcome to another episode of the Feel Freaking Amazing Podcast. Look who's here with us today, Ed Levitan, and we're delighted to be introducing and interviewing Dr. Miles Nichols. He is a functional medicine doctor who specializes in Lyme, mold, gut, thyroid, autoimmune disease. He's authored two books and founded the Medicine with Heart Functional Medicine Clinic in Colorado, as well as the Medicine with Heart Institute, which trains other providers and doctors in functional medicine. So Miles, welcome. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I was listening to an interview with Paul Stemitz, which is, who was a mycologist, and he was talking about psilocybin. And there is apparently a receptor, which I'm forgetting the name of, that SSRIs hit just a little bit. But if you look at psilocybin or mushrooms, uh, magic mushrooms or whatever you want to call them, they actually hit a thousandfold more. And that's why. The studies are now interesting studies are now being shown that only a couple of doses of psilocybin two three doses will actually decrease anxiety depression significantly versus just a couple of doses versus a continuous ssri so there's some really cool studies out that's not to take away from toxins in glyphosate or mold or anything else but there's also it's, it's a complex it's a complicated issue because the thing that I think people forget a lot of times is we can say the gut or we can say the brain, but it's not separate. Everything affects everything else. So not Eva from Wally. Your yeah. arms don't come apart, your head doesn't come up, like you're you're connected. Right. So if your brain's not working, it's a function it's a sign of something else not working and the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's I mean, thanks for bringing that up because psychedelics are quite an interesting advent in you know i don't find always for it to be effective for someone to just look at the lab testing for causes and address those with diet and supplementation and medications and and some lifestyle intervention sometimes there really does need to be a significant perspective shift from something like psilocybin or in other cases breath work and cold exposure and certain brain retraining practices that work on some of the traumatic backbone and limbic system dysregulation may have some significant impact. And, and then there are all these studies coming out on intergenerational trauma, how that's passing down, but that maybe there's some opportunity for rewriting stories and seeing that that intergenerational trauma can transmute into intergenerational gifts and that can start to create a new perspective in a person's life that can actually then translate into shifting the immune function the nervous system function the ability to maybe handle toxins and infections and some of these gut biome changes even some studies coming out about week-long meditation intensive significantly changing gut bacteria and gut biome and so it starts to become very interesting very quickly when you look at things like psychedelics, meditation intensives, brain retraining practices. We see breath practices being able to, to, to significantly calm an anxiety response very quickly. The right breath practice and panic attacks can be calmed very quickly. So there are some very interesting ways in which there can be modulation of the physiology that can sometimes have permanent shifts in the case of psilocybin one two sessions potentially having a shift that lasts you know, over a year maybe longer that uh, similar mdma studies on ptsd treatment resistant ptsd showing very strong strong impact 
The study just came out. It was like 71%. It's ridiculous. 71% what? Uh, positive effect of a shift, a significant impact in the scores of PTSD scores. I mean, so a 71% what drug, improvement yeah. in PTSD scores like, with what drug says? I'm not sure what the, no, it's MDMA. MDMA, yeah. Okay. Uh, but like, what drug do we ever see doing that? Like, if there were drugs that did that, everybody would be all over it. You can't patent it, can you? you can't patent it. No. MDMA is not a natural compound, but I, it's not patentable because it's off, it, it's off sort of, it's past that point. So old. Yeah, so it's hard to profit off of. So that's why the nonprofit MAPS is a public beneficiary company that's basically donor funded to get this phase three trial, to get this through phase three trials, which is pretty incredible. It's one of the only instances in which a, uh, a, a donor funded nonprofit pushed a drug through phase three successfully. And they're still, I mean, it's still wrapping phase three up right now, but but the, the second result that just came out a few days ago, actually, a uh, confirmatory um, result in their phase three trial showing significant benefit and very good safety profile. Okay. And of the people who have mental health symptoms, when you look at your practice, what percentage of them start to improve? And I always say to people like, look, you, whatever symptom you're coming up with, that's your Achilles heel. That's what you're going to, when you hit the skids and you go down and you stop taking care of yourself, that's what you're going to develop. So keeping in mind that, sure, you can flare again, but do you see a significant portion of people who start to have re- either improvement or resolution in their symptoms as you drill into this? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Some people just say that, you know, and, and a lot of people, it's it when I dig into it with people and really in the case history, talk to people often, there are a number of people who they say, you know, I, w- I handled stress pretty well for until, you know, this year. And there were some stressful things happening in this year, you know, 10 years ago that that, you know, I just attributed it to I was going through a divorce or I was having this or I was having that or something happened. And I just attributed it to that. But like before that, I handled stress pretty well. I wasn't anxious all the time. Sure. Maybe I was a, an anxious personality, but it wasn't getting in my quality of life, my functioning and in, in my day-to-day experience until 10 years ago, it started. And so often, especially in cases like that, where it's it's like the, there's a time in which it it significantly shifted and amplified, even if that seems to be connected with trauma. Sometimes there's really a significant connection with also infection, toxin, gut dysfunction, and 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 sometimes the nervous system gets put chronically into another state that that also utilizing some of the mind-body interventions, the breath work, the brain retraining, meditation, maybe psychedelics, that there can be this shift where people can notice and and, and find significant differences where they feel like they're back to before that, that I'll call it an amplification of, uh, of dysregulated nervous system function occurred and people feel like, oh, wow, now... My nervous system's more like what I'm used to, what I was used to in in most of my life. Where, of course, yes, situations get bad and it's stressful, and there's a little bit of difficulty sleeping or handling certain things. But for the most part, day to day, it isn't that big of a an issue. And I find that a lot for people. I had a patient yesterday who I've been seeing for years, and when she showed up in my practice. She was so sick and and nothing worked for her, right? Like she had had chemical sensitivities and she had mold and she had anxiety and she wasn't sleeping and she just was brittle and had histamine issues. It was just messy. And we've been doing a lot of toxins work. So I saw, her, like, I saw her in person yesterday and I was like, you look good. Like she looked good. She felt good. And she said to me, yeah, I didn't like doing the metals treatment at the time. But then she did three courses and got rid of her metals. She said, but in retrospect, it was the linchpin that had her no longer be so sensitive to histamine and no longer have, I was like, how's your anxiety? She's like, it's it's actually gone. I'm not anxious. I'm like, that's so cool. Just this. And and it's, not, it's the stuff that's invisible to life, right? Because nobody thinks they have metals. 
but you got it from your mama and you'd live in this world and you'd fish and fillings and lead pipes, lead paint, lead gasoline if you were born when I was. And it's just amazing and how profound the transformation is for people when you pull the right lever, like they get better. Yeah. It's pretty cool to watch. Well, speaking of levers, what you mentioned a couple of times, breath work and um, cold exposure. What are the things that you recommend for people that they do outside? Is there a specific breath work that you recommend? Is there cold exposure, period of time? What's kind of, what's your recipe? And just for the record, I'm not going to ever go in a cold plunge. Like it doesn't call to me. I'm sure in 10 years, I'll be like, oh, I did a cold plunge. But now I'm like, let's go to the sauna and be nice and warm. Yeah, we'll, we'll dump you in when, right. when I get mine set up. I know we got to get a bit of bigger plot of land so we can have like the self care area with that cold plunge. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, I have, I have cold plunge on my deck, and that's yeah. really nice to. I mean, you're in Colorado, so it's like cold out there, right? Well, not in the summer. <laughs> not in the summer, but then in the winter, it's winter more than summer. So yeah, yeah, All it's right. cold, and still getting the cold plunge in the cold. But <laughs> that's the best time. I actually find having a cold plunge in summer is not as effective like cold and cold is really you can't get really... cold but in poor ed so we have used to have this terrible patio and it was awful but who cares it's awful and he would go out in the winter and pour a bucket of cold water on himself and then we redid the patio and i was like you're not allowed to pour cold water on the patio it's gonna freeze and buckle the patio you can't ruin the patio so poor ed's like where am i gonna go like because you're not gonna walk out like well i was i was doing ice ice water buckets outside before the cold plunge wave yes, happens he really had to do it for years uh but i do at some point we'll get a cold actual cold plunge we'll see we have to figure out the place wire it up corner of the yard yeah i can i can talk breath work cold exposure a bit and some of those other therapeutics that are effective for breath work it's there's two different camps i'm gonna say <laughs> and one camp is the kind of over breathing techniques uh where you're actually breathing more deeper sometimes faster than you normally would and the other camp is an under a set of under breathing techniques where you're actually intentionally generating the feeling of being a little air hungry and taking in less air uh, per minute so the the volume of air actually per minute in the through the lungs decreases and we could probably spend hours talking about each of those. But what I'll just say as a general principle is that, that for the most part, the average, especially chronically ill person and people struggling with mental health issues, the average is breathing a little too fast and too much air compared to what would optimally regulate the nervous system, the brain function, the mood. That being said, there's some utility still to over breathing techniques for even people who are breathing a little too fast day to day. And the way I, I like to explain this is it's kind of like lifting weights is stressful to the muscles, but it makes the muscles grow if you do it in the right dose. If you do it, you wouldn't want to lift heavy weights all day, every day. You'd never recover and your muscles would break down and it would be very problematic and you'd injure yourself. But if you lift the right amounts of right amount of weight for the right amount of time to hermetic stress, it'll build your muscles back up and they'll be stronger than they were before having lifted those weights. I consider over breathing kind of like that of breathing, like the weightlifting of breathing. It is a stress on the body. And for most people, it's pushing them further into stress than they already are. But the right dose can be hormetic and can help regulate the nervous system function. It's important though that people know that that is a more of a sympathetic fight or flight kind of state that they're putting themselves into intentionally for a time followed by relaxation so when we look at a, a very effective and well-researched breath breath practice like wim hof breathing for example wim hof breathing practice which has been studied to reduce and almost eliminate the symptoms of endotoxemia when they inject dead e coli directly into the bloodstream people because e coli is a gram negative bacteria it has a polysaccharide or lps in its cell wall you inject that into the bloodstream it's just like a person who has leaky gut who's getting a flood of 
of bacteria in the bloodstream getting LPS elevations. And we even have lab tests to look at LPS antibodies and you know, we'll look at LPS in the blood sometimes to measure leaky gut intestinal permeability. It's sort of like you're directly putting it in the vein. So no matter the gut status, you're just getting directly LPS in the vein. The Wim Hof breathing was shown to practically eliminate the symptoms that people experience. They get headaches, nauseous, feel weird, get a lot of pains, and 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 they feel miserable for a few hours usually. But with this breathing, they didn't. And also the inflammatory elevations that occurred due to that endotoxemia were cut basically in half in the endotoxin study for the breathing group that was doing the breathing. And so cut and cut inflammation in half and reduce the symptom of endotoxemia. That sounds really, really good for the perspective of a lot of people who are struggling with maybe gut issues and endotoxemia or chronic infections and the byproduct of the toxin from that. It might help a lot for people. The challenge with that kind of breathing is that is that it is a hormetic stress so someone who's really depleted really weak they, or really anxious might push their anxiety further might go into a panic because you look at panicky breathing it's fast it's this kind of a fast breathing it's like lamaze breathing actually yeah and when hot breathing it's a little different than that it's like fully in natural out so it's not the same, but it's it's close enough that some people get triggered like into anxiety. Yeah, but, but I'm going to actually tailor that a little bit because I think the majority of people that start out with breath work aren't you are only breathing from the top, and until you learn to move your belly and your belly muscles uh, are able to move and you're able to move your diaphragm down. Any kind of breathing is going to be tough, and you do want to go. My reckon, my general idea is to first teach people belly breathing, and then you can do the over under. You can do a lot of things, but I do think when, if people are trying Wing Hof and are just breathing into their chest, which is, I think, the beginners what they do, that's when you get into trouble. So. Making sure breathing right into your belly is going to make is going to make the huge difference. Like a baby breathes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Diaphragmatic and abdominal breathing is very important, and, and and can definitely make a big difference. And and sometimes where I'll start people is if you know depending on their natural breathing pattern, I'll have I'll do an assessment where I'll have people you know, breathing normally while sitting, how long can you hold your breath on the exhale before you get the first definitive desire to breathe in or an in, involuntary in diaphragmatic contraction. And that gives me an assessment for where they're starting from. And people who are starting from a certain point where they maybe can 20, 25, 30 seconds, they're fine holding on an exhale without preparing for it, without taking big deep breaths, just normal sitting inhale exhale through the nose for them i think often starting right into full-on you know wim hof practice is fantastic and they do really well for the people who they're really struggling with a five or ten second definite desire for air they're they're at a different place in terms of the chemoreceptors in the brain and their sensitivity to carbon dioxide is is really low uh, threshold for carbon dioxide and desire to breathe. And that the lower the threshold, the more I see benefit to under breathing training to increase that threshold prior to beginning to do some of the over breathing techniques as well. And some people do great with one, some people do great with both, some people do great with uh, some people. What I'll have them do is I'll, I'll say do five minutes of under breathing and then do. The Wim Hof breathing, and then go back and do five more minutes of under breathing. So you're sandwiching it in between, and they do a, extremely well with that. Uh, there's tremendous research on Wim Hof. There's tremendous research on some of the under breathing techniques with nervous system regulation and and anxiety and panic reduction and improvements in asthma and sleep and sleep apnea. And so there's a. It also depends on what a, what are people coming in with as their picture as to 
how much of which would be beneficial. But I would say that just to give a couple, throw out a couple names, I think the Wim Hof breathing technique is fantastic for a lot of people, just to understand the safety contraindications, et cetera. And then Buteco breathing is really, really wonderful for people. Uh, a lot of people like box breathing as well. And then diaphragmatic abdominal breathing. These are some of the big ones that I think are, are highly effective. I find people getting tremendous benefit from. Well, so where can people find you? Because you've got a lot of information. I think it feels like you're just scratching the surface. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Best place is, is my clinic is called Medicine with Heart. And medicinewithheart.com is the best place where there's a free blog that's available that has a lot of information that comes out. So we'll put out information about some of the topics that we've been talking about today, a variety of things related to, to mental health, things related to optimization, things related to infections, toxins, gut function, all that goes in there, autoimmunity. So there's lots of free information in the blog there. And if people want to get in touch with the clinic, find out more about what that's like to work in the clinic, they can book a call there with one of my staff members to discuss that. So medicinewithheart.com is the best repository in place for information. And from there, you can get into the blog and get into some of the other areas that we uh, cover. Awesome. awesome. No, it's been very educational, really okay. cool. Yeah. Well, thanks you. Thank you for being here. And for the listeners, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Feel Freaking Amazing podcast. If you love it, give us a thumbs up and pass it forward so people can transform their health because you're meant to feel freaking amazing. So, Miles, thanks for being here. And we look forward to chatting with you again soon. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And take care, everyone. Were you inspired and empowered today? Don't forget to follow so we can help you keep transforming your health. Until next time. 